The first speaker uh, who will open the technology part uh, is a person with unusual hobbies. For example, he produces his own beer and he also likes boxing. Uh, when I asked him uh, why, uh, he said that it makes him a better person. I think you will have uh, you will have opportunity to speak with him uh, about it during the break. Uh, what's more, uh, he is a huge fan of board games, especially Munchkin, and he's our own volleyball manager. <laughs> what I really like about him uh, is, is his enthusiasm, which he shares with others. So please meet Robert Matosek. Hi. Can you hear me well with that mic? Cool. Uh, good morning and welcome on my presentation that will be dedicated to NoSQL databases and everything that you need to know to start using them in your project. My name is Robert Matusevich and for the next 40 to 45 minutes I would like to share as much knowledge about NoSQL databases that I have. I hope that after this talk you will, have the dif you will know the difference between the relational databases and NoSQL databases you will know the strengths and weaknesses of different types of NoSQL databases. And I also hope that after this presentation, you will sit at your project, look at the code, and see where are the places where you are currently using relational databases and where NoSQL fits better. But before we go to the core topic of my presentation, I would like to talk a little bit about relational databases. It will help us understand why there is a need for a new storage mechanism and where SQL databases are not good enough to make our product nice. Relational databases are with us for more than 30 years. Uh, it means that they are more in this world than I am and probably most of us here in that room. And <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and for these 30 years, they've proven that they are very powerful and helpful technology that we can use on our day-to-day -day development. They offer us a persistent storage, which means that the data that we store at the database will live even when the process that creates those data ceases to exist. Uh, it is very helpful when, for example, you want to store a data from one place and read it from another, or when you want to read the data from different times uh, in the time scale. The second nice characteristic or nice feature of relational databases is that they offer a nice way of handling concurrent access to data. Those are the transactions. And with the transactions, it doesn't matter how many writes to the database we have or reads from the database we have. It's the responsi responsibility of the database to order those reads and writes uh, in such a way that the reader will always have the most recent value that is good and well-defined. For me as a programmer, the good thing about relational databases is that I can work with those data using a pretty well-standardized uh, language to, uh, to manipulate the data that is stored in an engine, and this is the SQL. And I know that few of you will tell that the SQL is not very well-standardized, but for me as a programmer, I can easily switch from a, a one platform or one database to another, another database, and just read the difference between a different implementation of that SQL, what additional features that platform implements, or what feature it doesn't implement, of, or what feature it implements wrongly. Uh, last very important thing about relational databases is that for a very long time they served as an integration point. So when we have, for example, five or six applications that needed to exchange the data, data between them, we probably would use uh, one single database that would serve as an integration point and some of the application would read the data that other application would write the data into that database. We won't dig into that uh, more because nowadays it's uh, seen as an empty pattern and we try to divide our relational databases in such a way that each database is used only by one application. Of course I wouldn't create this stack if uh, relational databases wouldn't have their own problems. And for me as a programmer, one of the biggest problems of relational databases is that when I'm working with the data at my program, I use a cohesive structure of the data that represents the real life object. Like for example, the order. When I'm working with the order, I'm working with the object 
the class instance that contains uh, customer data, order details, the amount that the customer needs to pay for his order, and the payment details. But when I finish working with those data and one, I want to store that data in my database, I need to decompose my object into the smaller parts, lose the uh, relational inf relation information between the data that I have, and then store that in different data in different table in database and in different rows in a database. And this is very unhelpful for me because when I want to investigate how the data relates in the database, I don't have explicit information uh, that I can use to uh, analyze that data. And this problem had, had, had its own name in a in books. It's called Object Relational Impedance Mismatch. And we currently try to solve that with uh, using Object Relational Mapping Frameworks, which uh, help us solve that problem, but, uh, but also introduce uh, other problems like we lose the connectivity to the performance problems of the query that we are trying to connect to create. Um, there is also another problem with uh, SQL databases is that they don't scale very well horizontally, which means that it's very hard to put them on different machines. They scale very well with uh, vertically, which means that we can add any hardware to our server that will help us to meet our performance requirement or storage requirement, or we can switch the server entirely to a bigger one. The problem with this approach is that it is very costly uh, because new hardware for the database purposes is very expensive. And with the first approach, uh, the way or there is an upper boundary that you can scale to. And it would be great if we could scale databases horizontally. And I know that probably few of us tell me that there are some techniques that can help us to scale that way. Uh, one of the techniques is just to separate uh, servers for read operation and another servers for write operation. Uh, but that approach has own minuses because now we need to store the same data on the read servers and the same data on the write servers. And we are introducing a delay between writes and reads. And another approach is the sharding, which just means that we want to put SQL database on different servers. And it's also extremely hard because now we need to uh, choose what data will be served on uh, what server. We need to find a method to distribute the query to a proper server to pick a correct data. And we also need to fix uh, problems with the primary case that need to be used Unix. Uh, there is a lot more problems with the sharding and Martin Fowler in one of the it talk, said that he talked with the developers that try to do sharding and in many, many cases it's just an unnatural act uh, for the databases. Okay, so we are now aware of two main reasons that we need a new storage mechanism, so we could talk about NoSQL a little bit from now on. And the problem with SQL is that it doesn't have a strict definition that would help me explain what it is, but fortunately it has some core characteristics that are helpful to describe if the database is NoSQL or not. And the main characteristic of NoSQL databases is that they are non-relational in terms of relational databases. So we are not talking about the relation between the information, but we are talking about the relation is in SQL databases, which mean uh, tables and rows, or ordered rows in tables. And in NoSQL databases, we don't need to store uh, the data in that format. The second important characteristic of uh, NoSQL databases is that they are not aware. They designed it from the scratch to be aware of the multiple machines we are working on and to be easily scalable and put on multiple machines. And the third very important characteristic is that in many, in most situations, the NoSQL databases are schemaless, which means comparing that to relation database that when we are putting something into the database, NoSQL database, it doesn't have to have consistent structure, which is not the same as we in relational database when, where when we are putting something in database, then when we put something in one table, it always needs to have the same columns. And some rows doesn't need to have all the columns, but we cannot add additional columns to one row. We need to add columns to all of the rows. 
There are a few database tables that I would like to describe now, and we start from the easiest one and build up to the more complex during the presentation. And definitely the easiest uh, of NoSQL databases is so-called key value data stores. And they are very simple because they work uh, in the same way as a hash table or dictionaries in many programming languages. So we have a K that have a value attached and put that K with the value to the database. And then when you want to retrieve that value from database, we just ask the database with those key, give me that value. The good thing with that kind of databases is that they don't know what is the structure of the data we are putting into the database. So it means we can throw at the engine anything we want. It can be a simple value, simple integer. It can be a little bit complex uh, string. Or it, be, it may be some extremely complex thing like uh, image or graph data structure or a binary file. It's very similar to uh, blob in relational databases. We put something in the database, and the database doesn't know what it is. And the good thing about that approach is that the writes and reads to the database are very, very fast. So the best use case for that kind of database is when we, try, when we want to have a very nice performance in a scenario when we are doing enormous number or, of writes and an enormous uh, number of reads. A uh, few examples is, for example, storing session data in a game engines when we want to quickly store information about users to the database, uh, gathering or distributing data between IoT sensors, uh, or the data that IoT sensors uh, gathering and sending uh, to us, and any kind of time series that are not well defined and just came to us as an opaque value. There are also some uh, anti-use cases for that kind of the database, and one of the main use cases is that uh, you want to perform many oper one operation on many case, because those kind of operations work well with one operation per one K. And when you have, for example, the relation between data, because database engine doesn't know how the data is structured, then when you want to use engine that know about this structure, it, it isn't the best one. And the third problem with that kind of the databases is that if you don't know how the data looks at the database engine, that, then you cannot query uh, by data. So if you tag data with some uh, useful values that you'd want to use, you won't do that in that kind of the databases. Uh, there are a few main databases that are very popular currently in the world. Uh, one of these is a rack, which is very popular key value store used in many commercial companies. Uh, for example, by Beta, beta Twin to store session data of the users. Uh, there is also a Redis, which is uh, very nice because it stores its data into the memory. So if you really need uh, something that is extremely fast and uh, you need to use a memory to store that, you would use probably a Redis. And the project Voldemort is very cool because it is an open source implementation of uh, Amazon DynamoDB, the first uh, key value database that exists in the world. Uh, the second kind of the NoSQL database that I would like to describe is so-called uh, document database. And it's also very similar to the key value database. Uh, from the high level point of view, we have a key that points to the value. But the difference between the two of them is that in that type of the databases, the engine knows what the value is. So it's aware of the structure of the document. Uh, the document can be a XML, JSON. The most popular is a JSON, but it can be any kind of uh, semi-standardized uh, data that is seen as document by this database. And the good thing also about this kind of database is that not all documents need to have uh, the same structure. Document that is stored for 1K may have additional fields that documents stored for another key uh, doesn't have. Uh, and another difference is that in that situation, because you are aware of the structure of the document, you can query your data by the tags that the document has. So in that example, we can, for example, query not only by the ID key, uh, but also by the name, or by the scores, or by the specialization. 
that is the good thing about those kind of databases. These, these databases can be used for uh, storing logging data because um, each log, warning, error, exception, info can be stored as a separate uh, type of the document. Uh, it's very well fit into storing any uh, data that is somehow structurized, so uh, products in uh, our uh, site or uh, blogs, blog posts in our blog, comments in our blogs. That are the main use case for uh, that kind of database. Uh, two main uh, examples of uh, databases, document databases, is uh, Apache CodeDB and Apache MongoDB. They are the most well used, mostly used in a commercial environment. Uh, that type of the database that I'd like to describe is one of uh, the hardest for me. It's uh, one of the hardest to understand because uh, it connects many features that are uh, implemented in other databases. The similarity between those databases and the two previous that I described is that it also works on keys. But the difference is that the key points to a uh, something comparing to something that we are now that looks like a table. So if you retrieve the data from the column family store by the key, you will get a set of tables like in the relational databases. The difference between column family store and uh, SQL engine is that in column family store, these tables, the rows in those tables doesn't need to have all the columns. It will be a little clear after uh, this more detailed example. Uh, on the right, the first code that we have is a column, actually three columns, uh, with the name, email address, age, and gender, and each column has a value. And this is the smallest unit in a column family store. Uh, a little bit bigger is a uh, one row. One row is uh, in a column family store that hit a key and a column or many columns, in that case the columns are email address and the age. And the column family is represented by many rows. In that uh, example there are two rows, Jonathan and Abigail. And one row has two columns, the second one also has two columns, but one column differs between those uh, two rows. And the whole column family is also uh, located by the key that in that situation is a user profile. And column family stores are very cool for the situation when we, for example, want to expire, expire data that we are storing in our engine. So if we are collecting a time series that are valid only for amount of time, um, it's easy to delete them because we can add a timestamp as an additional column and then the query the data by this column because this is like the additional difference between uh, to previous database engine that in that case, in addition to querying by key, uh, we can also query by uh, columns that are specialized for that kind of use. Uh, they are very good for uh, streaming data, creating uh, rec recommendation engines when you can put information about what you like or dislike as a columns and are very good to implement uh, data feeds. This is how the Instagram is using column family stores in their products. Um, two main representatives of uh, that type of the database. One is uh, Apache HBase. It's a product used at Facebook. It's actually developed as Facebook and open source. And the second one is uh, Apache Cassandra, which is also open source. And all those three examples of database that I just described are so-called aggregate database, and we call them in that way because they work on uh, aggregates, so on something that looks like a logical unit from the perspective of a human. Uh, it can be an order, it can be a blog post, it can be a, a comment. And the good thing about that kind of databases is that uh, there is no big impedance mismatch between how the data look when we are working in a program and how the data look when we are working in the database. The thing that we are work the, f the object that we are using in our program looks very similar, so when you have a pro problem in the production, 
you can directly look into the database and we will have the information about the structure of the data and the locality. The second good uh, thing about those databases is that when we are working on the aggregates, it means that we are working on the information that, has, that is queried in the same time. So when we query one document, we, for example, order, we query the information about the customer, his orders and the payment details uh, in one query, which means which mean that we can easily distribute uh, those documents between different nodes. And when we access those different nodes, we always get all the information that is required from one node. The next type of the databases that we have is uh, not even similar to the previous one that we described, and this is the graph databases. Uh, the store, they store the information as a set of the nodes and the relation between the nodes. So for example, we can have uh, a node that represents an actor, uh, the relation that represents the movies that the actor played in, and another node will be the, actually the movies within the actor played. And those kinds of the databases is very cool because it imitates how we organize the information that we are using or on a daily basis. We usually think in terms of uh, simple nodes like persons, books, uh, objects, products, and the relation that we see between them. And one of the coolest examples of how the graph databases are used, are used is a Google search engine. Uh, and Maybe you notice that when you put something, when you try to search something in uh, Google and you put a text into a search box, for example, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, the Google will return you a list of uh, results and on top of that will be the Leonardo da Vinci, the artist. And to this point it's very easy because that kind of the search can be done with simple uh, keyword search. But besides the information about this author, Google will also suggest you uh, that maybe you want to look at the artwork that this artist made or uh, the text that he wrote or the inventions that he described. Or it can also propose you another person that you want to look at, for example, uh, Van Gogh or Raphael or maybe Leonardo DiCaprio. I don't know why in this case Google <laughs> is proposing <laughs> uh, that person, probably because of uh, the name. Second nice use case for uh, um, graph databases is how the Facebook is using it for uh, uh, discovering the people that we are now. So when you are trying to put something into the search for in a, uh, Facebook and you are searching for a new person, it will actually create a graph and count the person that you know and the person that you are looking for and we order by dot count the list of the results so there is a high probability that the first person that will be recommended to you uh, is also a, a friend of many of people that you already know. Uh, it can also suggest you a <coughs> restaurants that are near the place that you are living um, or movies that were uh, watched by uh, your friends and posted on a Facebook. Uh, this is all because we are building a graph of data, we are aware of the all nodes that we are have and about the relation that we have between data. Additional use case for that kind of the databases is a uh, fraud detection, so we can build the graph based on uh, people that are using a specific bank, the relation between those people, uh, between the operation that those people uh, made and based on that we can uh, tell if uh, the next operation is a scam or not. Uh, identity management is very cool use case for that because we can build a graph that will represent uh, the person I know and if I want to grant an access to somebody I can check if other person that that person knows also have, grant, also have access to the same resource, uh, if you work in a department that have access to that resource or not and based on that information I can either give him an access or reject it. And of course, obvious uh, use case for that kind of the database uh, is uh, recommendation engines, where I can recommend a movie, for example, not only 
given the information what movie I seen and how I scored them, but also by given the information what movie has been seen by my friends, how they score uh, those movies, and what is the relation between how I score the movies and how my friends are scoring the movies. And based on that, I can pick the best matches for me. Uh, there are two, two uh, implementations that are well known in the world now. The one is the Allegro graph, but for now it's used in an academic environment. The second one is a very cool, it's a Neo4j and is well known in a commercial industry. It's used mainly by between uh, eBay and Amazon to uh, improve how they show their data to the potential customer to uh, <coughs> promote uh, best products in a real time. Okay, so we now know four types of the different databases that are on the market currently, and how would you pick the one that is best suited for me? Uh, you can have two approaches. One is the approach that uses data size and data complexity, and in that approach, 90% of the use case are relational databases, and only 10% are the NoSQL database given the fact how many of the data you have and how much it is complex. For a very complex data, you will use a key value store. For a little bit complex, uh, column family or document store. And if you have a very complex data, a lot, a lot of very complex data, you will use a graph database. But I prefer also additional approaches, and one of the approach is a programmer productivity, uh, because when I can work with the data that is represented in the same uh, structure in my program and in the database, it means I can work faster without actually creating those relations in the database. Uh, performance is also uh, very important for me, so when I can fetch a whole document from the database with only one query with from many, many nodes, it is the use case that I want to use. And there is also additional hint that says uh, that when you have a very big application and you are using only one kind of databases, then you are probably using a wrong approach because for some part of your application, maybe the relational database is what you want to use, but probably for other type of application, or other uh, regions of your application, the NoSQL database would be a much better choice. And maybe it's not only one NoSQL database, maybe it's a, a document database and a graph database. And this statement is called a polyglot, polyglot persistence. And it just says that in your application, you can use more than one database engine. Cool. So from me, uh, I just shared with you anything I wanted. Uh, if there are so many questions.